Good afternoon, and uh, we're delighted at this uh, very substantial turnout. Uh, the TV cameras in the back outnumber the people in the room, but that's all right. We'll, uh, I'm sure Kurt is uh, used to seeing all that attention. Uh, and it's clear from this unusual arrangement with the, the, the panel seated off the, uh, the riser here, we need a bigger uh, space, which in a few months hopefully we'll have. <clears throat> Let me just say that uh, we're particularly honored to have uh, Assistant Secretary Campbell here. He has one of the greatest jobs in, uh, in the State Department. Uh, and one of the things you learn in any of these jobs is that the muse of history will almost always trip you up and give you issues to work on that you really didn't anticipate. I mean, just before I was sworn in in the job, Tiananmen occurred, so I was out of the China business, even though that's what I had worked on for many years, and became the Assistant Secretary for Cambodia. Chris Hill took the job, and he ended up being the Assistant Secretary for Pyongyang. So uh, we're going to hear something about uh, the uh, agenda that... Uh, a very interesting region these days uh, is presenting uh, Secretary Campbell. East Asia is probably in the most uh, dynamic period in terms of uh, shifting power relationships, uh, great challenges, uh, the nuclear proliferation being one, but economic relations, and not, with, not only with China, but with uh, the region more generally. Larger strategic relationships, India is now... Uh, sort of looking over the shoulder of the, of the region. So we're going to hear some, I'm sure, some very interesting uh, perspectives on what's going on in the region. Um, I'm also very appreciative that we have uh, a great panel. Stape Roy, a member, former member of our, uh, of our board here at the Institute, uh, a, an ambassador to everywhere, great colleague. <laughs> Priscilla Clapp, also a, a longtime colleague and and friend who knows Burma particularly uh, well, but knows knows the region, and our John Park, whose uh, focus has been on North Korea. And finally, uh, having Marvin Kalb as our interlocutor. Uh, Marvin uh, uh, presided over a very interesting uh, program we ran out in San Francisco in July called Conversations on War and Peacemaking, and uh, he, he quizzed uh, former secretaries of state, uh, George Schultz and Madeleine Albright, in the roughly the format we're seeing here today. So Marvin is uh, a member of the family that is helping us with these important public events. So with that, uh, Marvin, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Campbell, to start with the obvious, this has been a very active summer. I mean, we could start with the two secretaries, Clinton and Gates, being in Korea at the same time, having discussions with the South Koreans, Secretary Clinton in Hanoi, Secretary Gates going down to Jakarta. And one could have the impression of a neatly coordinated American policy toward Asia and the Pacific. Um, it all could have been an accident, too, uh, in travel plans. But what I'd like to hear from you is whether, in fact, it was the first stage of the un, unfolding of a, a new kind of policy. What can we look forward toward in the immediate or near future? Thank you. Um, first off, I could just say a few uh, welcome words. It's great to be with uh, Marvin again when I was a young graduate student and also a professor. We all looked up to Marvin at the Kennedy School, and it's great to see him here and uh, say thank you to the panel and to uh, Dick Solomon, who's led this wonderful institution um, uh, every day when we drive into the State Department, we all wish we could take a left instead of a right because <laughs> the new building is a uh, marvelous, wonderful architectural complement to the State Department. And we look forward to having you uh, uh, join us in the neighborhood, and we uh, thank you for all the good work that you've done, not just on Asia, but on a range of issues uh, as a whole. Um, Marvin, to directly answer uh, your question, um, Obviously, the United States is deeply engaged in a variety of areas and ways right now, and, and a primary focus has been on the challenges that we're facing, the immediate challenges in Afghanistan and Iraq and others in South Asia. But I think the truth is that this century, the 21st century, uh, will belong to the Asian Pacific region. This is the most dynamic area in my view, and it's not just because I'm responsible for this region. This is going to be 
a defining arena for uh, American power and purpose in the 21st century. And um, uh, I think there is a deep recognition in the Obama administration that the United States has to sustain an extremely high level of engagement uh, and activity uh, and uh, uh, purpose in the region as a whole. And I must say I'm very blessed to have not only a very strong player but a very uh, good friend really at the helm of the White House in, in Jeff Bader, who is our really primary architect on what we're trying to accomplish. What you saw this summer... Um, really is just what the region demands now, Marvin, uh, uh, no less. This is, the, this is the tempo on which we uh, must sustain uh, uh, a very strong position in Asia, but a position that uh, either through other challenges elsewhere or uh, changes in the region uh, itself uh, requires constant nurturing and attention. What would you say are the two most pressing challenges for the U.S.? in Asia now? Um, I couldn't limit to two, but I will try to be very short in my answer. Um, there are a number of uh, critical challenges that we face. Obviously, deep uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula. That is something, as, as uh, Ambassador Solomon has indicated, animates a lot of our time and attention. Uh, we have uh, major uh, challenges uh, associated with uh, uh, the rise of China, which I think is primarily an opportunity. Uh, we're working closely to uh, sustain a very high level of engagement and working together on a broad range of issues. Uh, there are uh, the challenges of building a new architecture in the Asian Pacific region. One, an architecture, a set of, series of meetings and uh, uh, engagement which, which we seek the United States playing a very active role. Kurt, in all my years looking at this, I've never understood the use of the word architecture. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Well, let me, let, let me just conclude, then no, I'll no, come back ahead. to architecture. The, the other issue that I'd, I'd like us not to uh, forget, we have a tendency to focus on the near-term hard challenges, but the truth is I would argue that some of, one of the biggest longer-term challenges in the Asian Pacific region is actually climate change. Um, mm -hmm. And it poses uh, enormous humanitarian and, frankly, I would argue national security issues on top of already uh, issues of terrorism and is fundamentalism uh, uh, in uh, parts of Asia as a whole. So it is the full range of challenges. I share your concern. I, I was at an interview once, and someone said, you know, what do you mean by architecture? Are you, you know, building a house? Uh, you know, the, the, and in fact, what, what it is meant to connote is a collection of countries that decide that they need to meet together, to work together on a range of issues. What's, what we see in Europe, for instance, over the, over the course of the last 30 years, are very deep, very stable institutions like the EU and NATO and others that have served as a mechanism to deal with disputes, to uh, manage complex financial and political matters, and essentially to chart a course for. Now, some of those institutions have been imperfect, but they've played a vital role in uh, uh, the sort of the political topography of, of Europe. What we see in Asia is, uh, frankly, numerous institutions, but all with relatively shallow roots. And one of the things that we think is going to be necessary over the course of the next generation is a deeper commitment, not just on the part of Asian friends, but on the part of the United States, to building an architecture that allows for greater cooperation and consultation on the critical matters that confront all of us in the 21st century. You didn't mention specifically Japan. And one of the issues that comes up with the Japanese now quite regularly and in an unusual way is the rapidity of political change in Japan now, which might throw the State Department a bit. And secondly, the rising tension on the issue of American bases in Japanese areas. How are you dealing with this? Are you any closer to finding a reliable, rooted Japanese political entity with which you can establish a relationship? First of all, if, if I could just underscore, we have a deeply reliable, strong partnership with Japan. And I would underscore that over the course of the last year, Marvin, there has been enormous reporting on one issue, and almost one issue alone, a Please. difficult base, deni uh, undeniably a difficult base situation in Okinawa. But unfortunately, what we have not seen is commensurate reporting on a range of other issues. So, for instance... Uh, Japan is the second largest contributor to uh, civil reconstruction and humanitarian projects in Afghanistan. 
mm-hmm. a commitment made during this particular government. Japan has provided uh, very real resources to deal with some of the challenges in the aftermath of Copenhagen climate change related matters. They are uh, supportive of our efforts. Japan stepped up and said, we want to join with the United States and the international community on sanctions against Iran without us asking. That's a very major step. And we've seen a very strong commitment on the part of uh, Japan in dealing with piracy issues around Africa. And more recently, what you will have noted is that it's not just the United States working with South Korea to ensure that we're closely tied together to deal with the outrage, the provocation of the Chonan. It's the Japanese with us. And so I, I think, unfortunately, the story that has largely been missed is how closely we've worked together during an undeniable, uh, you know, it's a seismic change in Japanese politics, a new government coming to power. Our consultations have been close, uh, and we have very real confidence about what we're going to be able to accomplish in the future. But you don't see any instability, then, in the relationship at all, given the rapidity of the political changes. Uh, I see that there is a uh, deep dialogue uh, and uh, a sharing of views uh, between the United States and Japan that in many respects is long overdue. Um, and uh, a lot of questions are being asked on both sides, and a lot of issues are being addressed in a way that I think is actually fundamentally very healthy and helps lead to a regeneration of uh, the alliance. Uh, we're joined here by uh, the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations. Friends here are, are, are uh, talking about their new study on, on attitudes. They have done some extraordinarily important work about attitudes in the United States about some of our key allies. One of the things that we find over the course of the last year or so is that we have unprecedented levels of support in Japan and the United States for the U.S.-Japan relationship. So I would say that among many things to worry about in the Asian Pacific region, the U.S.-Japan relationship is not one of them. It's not one of them. But what about the base problem, which is, after all, not a new problem. It's been around a long time now. But there does appear to be more tension in the relationship caused by that problem. You certainly see it in the Japanese press. You see it in commentary all over the place. So what, how, how does that stand now? Look, uh, this is an issue that uh, we've been working on for years. Yeah. The United States has a very strong commitment to do what we can to ease the burden on the people of Okinawa. But also we have a dual uh, responsibility to maintain a very strong deterrent uh, and uh, military capability in the Asian Pacific region. And our forces for deployed in Japan are a critical, probably the critical part of that uh, overarching objective. How many, how many American troops are in Japan? Oh, you know, the total numbers are, you know, airmen, soldiers, sailors, and Marines. It varies on a regular basis. The general way to think about it, Marvin, is about 100,000 for deployed troops, uh, give or take, in the Asian Pacific region. And probably uh, coming up on half of those or more are in Japan at any one time. I I would simply say that we have a process underway uh, between our Department of Defense and our State Department and our Japanese interlocutors. Uh, We've made a lot of progress over the course of the last several months, and uh, Prime Minister Khan stated very clearly when he uh, assumed the position of Prime Minister of Japan that he intended to go ahead with the agreement uh, between the United States and Japan. So we... Uh, uh, look, there are, uh, between allies, uh, there are often uh, uh, challenges. I'm proud of the way we've worked on these challenges, and I think we'll be uh, successful in the long run. Kurt, I really don't want to push you on this, but it would be interesting to find out your judgment as somebody deeply involved in the process right now. Whether, what, are we a couple of months away from an agreement? Mm. Look, I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. I would simply point out that the process associated with a major uh, set of steps associated with Okinawa began in 1995. I was actually in the Pentagon, started that process in 1995, um, and I think I've learned during the intervening periods not to hold my breath. So it could be quite a while yet before you get a deal. No, no, look, uh, I I would also suggest to you that this is going to be an ongoing issue. Um, We have a long-term commitment to making sure that we're a good neighbor in Japan and particularly in Okinawa. Well, one of the ways in which you're a good neighbor with Japan is in terms of measuring trade. Um, Japan is all over the American market, for example, perhaps not as much as it used to be, but certainly still there. And I'm wondering what 
new ideas perhaps has the Obama administration advanced to try to help increase trade in a very profitable way for both sides, but certainly the U.S. could use that right now. Well, let me um, just answer that question in a broader context, as you suggest, between the United States and Asia as a whole. One of the strong points that I think President Obama has underscored is that over time there's going to need to be a rebalancing of our economic relationship between uh, the United States and Asia, in which Americans are going to need to save more, and over time uh, uh, Asians are going to have to spend more, and they're going to have to buy products uh, uh, from uh, the United States and elsewhere. Now, there are complicated mechanisms associated with it. Uh, my wife is uh, the Undersecretary of, uh, of the Treasury. I am uh, on a regular basis schooled in the fact that I'm not to talk about macroeconomic or trade issues. I will not. I will not here today. Um, I, I would but you're say, a Kennedy school. Yeah. I would, uh, I would simply say that uh, uh, we are uh, deeply engaged in uh, a variety of efforts in Asia. The president has underscored his commitment to move forward on the Korea Free Trade Agreement. I think this is an important strategic commitment of the United States. There obviously will be some uh, details and issues to be worked out. Those are not my responsibility, but at a strategic level, it's very important for our two countries. We've also announced a strong intention to move forward with the Trans-Pacific Partnership involving a number of key players uh, uh, in Asia. It is uh, clearly a 21st century uh, a, a trade initiative, I think one that could set the scene for a broader and deeper engagement of the United States uh, in the region as a whole. And I think overall you will see in a range of U.S. government departments a desire to increase American exports. Ultimately, that's going to be uh, an important measure of our overall, su overall success in the Asian Pacific region. What is it that the U.S. can do now to advance the prospect for this kind of an end result? What kind of initiatives can the U.S. lay out on the table to make it more attractive for Asian markets to come to the U.S., the U.S. to go there, to make it easier for the United States to cope with the economic problems that we now have? Mm -hmm. Look, there are a number of initiatives that uh, are being undertaken and that are underway. I would also say, Marvin, just in fairness, the level of economic engagement between the United States and Asia over the last 20 years dwarfs anything compared to the rest of the world. So there's already been a substantial success and you will find that there is a very successful uh, market penetration in a variety of areas, aircraft, high technology, services, mm -hmm. medical, and other things in the Asian Pacific region. We, se we seek to replicate that, add to that uh, going forward. I think the truth is the last couple of years have been tough. Uh, economically in the United States. The most important contribu contribution that we can make uh, to a strong and stable uh, 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 U.S. policy in the Asian Pacific region, uh, region is a strong and stable American economy. And one of the ways I suppose that we can get to that kind of end result is somehow to persuade the Chinese government to be less manipulative perhaps in the way in which it deals with its currency. Um, how are you managing that U.S.-China relationship right now, starting with the economic perspective? Um, uh, I, I'm going to try to artfully dodge that so you're question. You're going to punt. Yeah, I'm not going to punt. I'm going to dodge. There's a different. A punt is a different than a dodge. Okay. So I, I, I'm, I'm we'll not going to. that I, later. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak about uh, the economic or, or macroeconomic issues right now. I will say I think there is a broad and deep recognition. Uh, in the Obama administration that it is essential to have a strong, stable, constructive relationship between the United States and China. And I think um, uh, we are committed to that. You will have seen over the course of the last uh, several months a uh, stepping up of diplomacy. There have been some major interactions between uh, our two sides. Those uh, uh, diplomatic uh, de deliberations cover the full range of issues before us. I think there is an uh, understanding uh, between the leadership of uh, our two countries that uh, we have a, a much better chance of dealing with the major challenges before us if we work together. Work together as well on this currency issue? I, I'm just really not going to. You're I, not going to go I'm there. I'm really just not going to. Okay, well, let's go somewhere else, but still stick within the China sphere because China is a subject that comes up 
in almost every conversation now. Mm -hmm. And I read just the other night a report by Linda Jakobsen, who is a China specialist, yes. and did a paper for a CIPRI in, in Stockholm, in which he raised a very interesting question, because from the outside, China looks as if it's this mammoth uh, country run by the Chinese Communist Party with the Chinese Army and Air Force and Navy kind of on the side, exercising influence, the depths of which we don't quite grasp at the moment. And Linda says there's a whole new wave of leadership types arising on the Chinese horizon that are now demanding more space, more time, more power. And I'm wondering how you at the State Department see this. Um, I, I think at, at the root of your question is uh, a recognition that for our diplomacy to be successful with China requires not just the kind of very high-level White House to the senior exactly. officials, State Department to senior officials, but a much broader and deeper engagement uh, of the kind that, uh, to be perfectly honest, we spend a lot of time on. I'll give you a for instance. One of the things that President Obama uh, launched and Secretary Clinton is trying to uh, carry is, initiative, is an initiative to increase the number of American students who study in China by 100,000 over the next four years uh, through uh, grants, through working with other foundations, uh, with other uh, educational institutions. Um, we think one of the most, uh, and what we've seen is a substantial increase in Chinese students who come to study in the United yes. States. We believe that there needs to be a much larger group of Americans who understand not just China but Asia as a whole, and we're seeking to promote that sort of people-to-people -people diplomacy, which, you know, sometimes is viewed as an afterthought, mm -hmm. but when one looks back on that in time, it turns out that those initiatives, in fact, were uh, as or more significant than some of the very high-level stuff that goes on. But, uh, I'm curious, Kurt, how are you doing this? Are you, is the government now providing more uh, scholarship money for students going to China? How are you encouraging the study among the American students of the Chinese language culture? How are you doing this? Well, I, I, don't, I, I won't go into it in great detail, but um, it, doesn't it doesn't involve currently uh, uh, more resources on the U.S. side. Frankly, in the current environment, don't um, we don't have it. Um, but what we have seen is a commitment on the part of the Chinese government to provide 10,000 scholarships, which was made a few months ago to American students. And uh, the idea here is not just to allow uh, students from elite universities, but to actually reach into the heartland, places, people and places who may not have had as many opportunities well, to engage in Asia. What we've also tried to do is uh, make uh, institutions and people aware of existing monies and ex existing scholarships. Mm -hmm. Turns out there's a lot of this that people were not aware of. And frankly, uh, you know, there is a little job boning going on as well. Mm -hmm. We're trying to encourage... Uh, uh, Chinese and Asian entrepreneurs to invest in uh, efforts to bring Americans uh, to China and to Asia as part of a larger uh, sort of uh, overarching uh, uh, initiative. And American foundations, I think, increasingly are responding to the challenge uh, of Asia, which is the, you know, the defining. Kurt, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, and it's, it's very interesting. And does the department have a new appreciation, perhaps, of the balance of power inside of China today. And I raise the question within the context of many, many more stories suggesting a rise of, of an old-fashioned kind of Chinese nationalism, which you find among, to my surprise anyway, among many students. Uh, it's not necessarily anti-Americanism, mm -hmm. but a rise in Chinese nationalism followed by a belief that, hey, China is the Middle Kingdom and people ought to bow down to us a bit more. Ha Number one, do you find that to be the case in your dealings with the Chinese? And what do you do about it? Um, let me say, particularly in the last couple of years, it is undeniably the case in our interactions with uh, the government and the intelligentsia and key players who are interested in China's role in the world, there's a recognition that China is playing a larger role on the international scene, and they want uh, the respect Indeed. 
that 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 uh, that coincides with mm-hmm. such a role, and I think it is incumbent on the part of the United States and other key players uh, to provide uh, uh, China with that recognition. I think one of our challenges uh, is uh, to make clear one of the hard things about uh, about being a global player is that not only are there great privileges associated with that, but there are responsibilities associated with that. And so we've been trying. Uh, over the course of the last uh, many months to work closely with China on a range of initiatives that we think are, are both essential for maintenance of peace and stability and for uh, uh, global economic issues that you referred to. I mm-hmm. think I'd, I'd allow others to speak about it, but clearly the cooperation between the United States and China and other Asian countries played a critical role uh, when the uh, the, uh, uh, the global economy was uh, teetering, teetering. Uh, uh, a, a year and a half or so back. Um, what you've seen is very close coordination between uh, uh, China and the United States on uh, uh, initiatives associated with North Korea, uh, the culmination of UN Security Council Resolution 1874 after the uh, nuclear tests, close uh, work on uh, issues associated with Iran, and on non-proliferation uh, issues and the like. So, so I mean, I, I think uh, striking that balance is going to be a critical part of American foreign policy. Well, you mentioned Korea a moment ago, and so I can't resist asking you um, about former President Jimmy Carter's article, which appeared on the op-ed page mm-hmm. of the New York Times today, in which the former president says flat out that as a result of his visits and talks with the North Koreans and the Chinese, he believes that North Korea is now open and is positive about a deal, a a broad-based deal with the United States, South Korea, and on the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And I'm wondering whether when you picked up that, the uh, time stay and you took a look at that, whether you were surprised. Did that coincide with your view of the um, North Korean policy? Thank you. Let me just say that, first of all, we were... Uh, grateful for the role that uh, President Carter played in achieving the re- release of Mr. Gomes, who had uh, gone into North Korea and was under some duress. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he went there on a humanitarian mission to help retrieve him, uh, uh, we are quite grateful for. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as President Carter indicated in his op ed and his comments, uh, he uh, did not carry a message for us. He was not involved in any uh, 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 diplomacy uh, orchestrated uh, or initiated uh, by uh, the United States government. But let's assume he couldn't uh, resist. Um, l- let me just say that uh, I think some of the messages and the, the, uh, uh, the uh, specific uh, language that the North Koreans used are well known to us and that we have seen those statements over uh, a period of years. Uh, We currently have uh, Ambassador uh, Sung Kim and Ambassador Bosworth returning from consultations with uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, and China. Uh, And also they'll do subsequent uh, discussions with Russia about the way forward on the Korean Peninsula. I would simply say that uh, it is our view that the United States is prepared to sit down to work with our other uh, six-party compatriots uh, and partners on uh, uh, a uh, six-party negotiation with North Korea under the appropriate circumstances. We need to see a re-engagement between North and South after what we have seen uh, vis-a-vis the Chonan. And I think we need to see some signal from uh, the North Koreans that they are truly serious about fulfilling the commitments they have made uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, steps uh, towards denuclearization in the 2005 statement and otherwise. And I think um, some of the actions that we have seen uh, uh, call into question whether uh, they're prepared to take those steps. I think Secretary Clinton has suggested that uh, that we uh, will keep that door open, as the President have as well, and we are committed to do that. And uh, we uh, will work very closely with our allies to try to have a united front in uh, presenting uh, an option for the way forward with North Korea. Kurt, I've listened, I think, carefully to what you've just said. And I think you're saying that the U.S. government does not share 
the former president's generally optimistic view of the relationship now? Yeah, I, I, I'd rather not characterize. I, I, I don't know exactly uh, uh, President Carter's thinking. He did come in and brief Secretary uh, Clinton on this. Um, and he uh, wrote his article, so yeah. he's briefed you when you know it. Yeah. I mean, do you share it? I mean, is he saying something that you didn't know? Yeah. I, I think in terms of how he laid out the position of the North Korean government, uh, we, those points are well known to us. But I must say, in recent years, we've seen a series of actions, nuclear tests, uh, other provocations, including the sinking of the Chonan, which uh, have raised very serious concerns about uh, the ultimate goals and ambitions of the North Korean leadership. We remain uh, open to the possibility of moving forward, uh, but we don't want to return to a, uh, a way of doing business with North Korea where they... Uh, as Secretary Gates has said, you know, for the same commitments, receive uh, new uh, commissions, new new support. Uh, we we seek to break that pattern, um, and uh, we're prepared uh, uh, to be patient towards that end. Uh, but we also are, along with our allies, committed uh, to oops, uh, committed to uh, a, a process of diplomacy uh, with North Korea when and if they're ready. Is it possible, Kurt, that what it is that the North Koreans and the Chinese told Jimmy Carter is a signal uh, of a positive nature that they hope the State Department would pick up? I, I think it'd be fair to say that we're very. Uh, Secretary ba uh, Ambassador Bosworth and Ambassador Sun Ken arrive home this evening, uh, and we will be looking to sit down with them to get a, a sense. We are seeing some signs of a renewal of humanitarian uh, assistance from South Korea to North Korea. Uh, the North Koreans released uh, the fishing boat that uh, they had taken uh, uh, a month and a half back. Uh, so there are some signs, but uh, I think we're uh, still waiting to see the ultimate uh, uh, direction going forward. I will say that uh, you, what you uh, see is a very close coordination between the United States and South Korea at, at the outset, but also with Japan, and we have shared very closely our views with Chinese friends about the appropriate way forward. What is – this thing has been going on, Kurt, an awfully long time. The, the problems with the North Koreans really go back, obviously, to the Korean War, and there have been so many diplomatic efforts, and presidents and ex-presidents have tried to manage this thing. We always appear to be – roughly at the same point. What has to break the ice at this point in order to move it forward? Um, a new leadership in North Korea, perhaps? You know, potentially. You know, it's difficult, uh, Marvin, to uh, speculate on hypotheticals. No, I appreciate o that. Obviously, uh, this is a very delicate time on the Korean Peninsula, and it's important for the United States to be deeply engaged, and we're seeking sure. to do so. So in all of our conversations in Northeast Asia, uh, uh, Topic one generally tends to be uh, developments on the Korean Peninsula. I, th I think it'd be fair to say we are trying to be prepared for uh, every possible conceivable uh, uh, direction uh, over the course of the next, the coming months. And I think you said earlier that in your dealings with the Chinese, you're getting a more cooperative Chinese understanding of the complexity of the Korean problem, that you're more or less seeing the same things together. I, I, look, I, I think the truth is that China has a complex calculus on uh, the Korean Peninsula, and that is just undeniable. There are we at a strategic level, we share many common interests. I think we want to maintain peace and stability. Uh, you know, we worry about some of the consequences of of of, of, uh, uh, of the revert of, of something else happening on the peninsula. We we. Um, we uh, seek uh, to prevent uh, proliferation, and we seek to uh, uh, create a uh, nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. So we have broad strategic areas in common, and we have been able to work together. I think it is not a secret that uh, during the period after the sinking of the Chonan, we had some very uh, challenging diplomacy at the United Nations. Uh, the president indicated as much in some of his statements uh, in Ottawa earlier this year. 
Uh, but overall, uh, we are committed uh, to, if anything, um, uh, having even more dialogue with China because we recognize that we have extraordinarily important responsibilities uh, with respect to the, uh, the way ahead on the peninsula. I've heard, you know, earlier on you, you said, Kurt, that the, um, the Asia-Pacific area is the area in the 21st century that the U.S. will be deeply engaged in. And I've heard some of our former colleagues at the Kennedy School speak about the problem of trying to see the rise of China as a challenge to be concerned about or a challenge that somehow through clever, smart diplomacy the United States could take advantage of and try to hook up with China in the fashioning of the new Asia. How do you see this as a challenge, an opportunity? You know, anyone who works on the diplomacy of Asia recognizes that it is simultaneously both. Really? Um, yes. And like most things in Asia, it requires uh, balance. And so I, I'll give you a, um, a, a wonderful little accidental anecdote. I remember in the 1990s I was working in the Pentagon, and a group of Japanese friends came in to see me. And they'd never been there. And the Pentagon's pretty imposing if you've never spent much time there. And they walked in, and, and you know, the meeting was a little bit curtailed. And the, the translator was just very rushed. And so my Japanese interlocutor kept uh, talking about the balance of power in Asia. But the interpreter kept getting it wrong and kept talking about the power of balance, <laughs> um, uh, which... which in reality, it's really unintentionally wise. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, if I could say one of the most important things, uh, Marvin, for the United States is to maintain that balance. And that balance means to recognize that we have to have a deep diplomacy in Asia towards China, with China. But it also means working with other key countries you will have seen over the course of the last several months. We've talked primarily about Northeast Asia, Japan, and South Korea, but also a deeper engagement with Indonesia, with Vietnam, with Malaysia, and I think most importantly, one of the most important elements that we've seen in Asia over the course of the last several years is the arrival of India, not just as a South Asian player, but India as an Asian player. And so that element is going to be important. And I think the truth is, as you think about uh, you know, crafting a strategy uh, uh, for China, there has to be elements that uh, involve deeply uh, a desire to cooperate and work together. Uh, but also there has to be a recognition of the challenges. We have a different system of government, uh, I think in many respects uh, slightly different ambitions, and how uh, we manage those are going to be um, extraordinarily important. History is littered with challenges of hegemonic transitions uh, gone awry. The good news is that I think the strategic leadership in both countries appreciates the challenge, are attuned to that challenge, and are trying to address it in constructive, helpful ways. So the idea of military confrontation between two superpowers like China and the U.S. is not even on a near horizon for consideration. I, I can't imagine anything that would be that would, more destabilizing uh, in sure. global politics than such a clash. And I think we need to do everything possible to build greater trust and confidence between our two sides. One of the things that we have been working on very hard of late is in an effort to build uh, and rebuild stronger military to military ties between the United States and China. Uh, not simply just to get to know each other, but also to create the kinds of, shall we say, rules of the road for how uh, our uh, two uh, forces need to work together, not just you know on the high seas and in the air, but mm -hmm. also in increasingly working together, hopefully in UN. Uh, uh, peacekeeping situation and humanitarian matters. And th this is of a cooperative nature, the, the military on both sides. That is its inspiration, yes. Let me ask you an impossible question as we end this part of our dialogue and go to our panel of questioners. What are the um, impossible things to predict for the United States dealing with China what are you not preparing for? What can possibly <laughs> pop up that you're going to say, yeah. Jesus, why didn't I think of this? My God. Yeah. I, 
let me just say that a good friend of mine that who had served in this job before uh, told me uh, at the outset uh, when I took over, he said, try to avoid two things. Uh, you know, don't talk about currency. We've, we've achieved. We, we've, You've done very well. We've achieved there. that so far, but the the, the day is still young. Uh, so that's number one. And number two is 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 really try to avoid answering hypotheticals. Um, I I think the truth is that we think a lot about uh, uh, unintended uh, and unanticipated outcomes and developments in Asia. Um, uh, uh, from the Korean Peninsula to uh, developments uh, in maritime matters to uh, other uh, big issues uh, that we uh, confront. I think um, it is critical for the United States to maintain that flexibility uh, and to recognize that history rarely is written in linear lines. And I think uh, that's uh, a point that uh, we need to underscore constantly in our diplomacy. Thank you very much, Kurt. Um, We're now shifting over to our panel, and we have three uh, experts here, and I will call upon them uh, to ask uh, Kurt Campbell a question. Uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, who is the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your very good comments so far. I would like to pick up on (laughs) a... On a point that uh, you and Marvin have already touched on, China's behavior and its attitude over the past year uh, suggest that many Chinese have concluded or believe that China's status in the world has risen as a result of China's rapid recovery from the global financial crisis, while the United States' status has declined. What are the implications for uh, U.S.-China relations down the road if, in fact, Beijing has concluded that the United States is a declining power and that China is now in a position to assert its interests in East Asia more strongly. And the add-on to that would be, if China has concluded that we're a declining power, it's possible that others in Asia see us in the same light, including possibly some of our allies. So, I mean, there's some potential enormous implications for our foreign policy in the region. I'd be interested in your comments Mm -hmm. on that. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, l- let me just provide a little uh, anecdote. Uh, I, I'm a uh, political appointee, so I'll be uh, in the State Department for a relatively short time. And uh, our civil and foreign service uh, officers are gracious enough to you know, uh, treat you with respect for the short time that you're there. Uh, State <laughs> Roy uh, is uh, probably among a handful of two or three people that are the most respected Asia hands who have served uh, in the department uh, over the course of the last half century, that long. So when his name comes up, I notice that you know <laughs> junior officers stand up a little straighter and they sort of focus <laughs> their gaze on some distant sort of uh, thing. So it's a it's it's a it's an honor to be with him today, and I, I appreciate the question. Um, I, look, uh, Steve. I I would take slight issue with the positioning of the question. I am finding increasingly in Chinese uh, intellectual discussion a recognition that uh, only at one's peril uh, uh, do you count out the United States. And what we see increasingly is a recognition that there was commentary about American decline in 1975 at the end of the Vietnam War and in 1989 at the end of the Cold War, only to find the United States because enor- of enormous advantages, the, uh, just the massive ingenuity, capabilities of our educational uh, system, the innovative uh, uh, qualities uh, of our government, and essentially the staying power, um, that, that in fact those, uh, that kind of uh, uh, belief turned out to be both short-sighted and wrong. And so I see more and more in Asia recognition that the United States is going to be uh, a dominant key player in Asia for at least the better part of the next 40 or 50 years. And I think that is a stronger uh, view now uh, in Asia uh, as a whole. And and, and so I I think that is more the animating feature of of uh, U.S.-China interactions, a recognition that, yes, China's uh, role on the global stage has uh, uh, grown much larger in recent years. 
But the truth is the United States has never left the stage, and we're going to be a main actor on that stage uh, for decades to come. Now, we need to fulfill that. We need to take the kinds of actions that Marvin underscored at the outset, uh, and we need to make sure that our economy, our diplomatic and military steps are in close, co in close conjunction with that ultimate goal. Thank you. You want a quick follow-up? you got uh, two minutes. No, I will uh, okay. defer to my <laughs> fellow panelists. Okay. Priscilla Clapp, the former charge d'affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Burma. Please. Um, hi. <laughs> hi, Priscilla. Thank nice you. to see you. I'm just trying to figure out if this is on. Yep. Can, you, can you hear me? Maybe use that Okay, I'll, I'll use this one. Okay. Um, for the past 20 years, U.S. policy toward Burma has centered on the National League for Democracy and on the legacy of the 1990 elections. The 2010 elections this year, this November, will close the book on 1990 and have caused the NLD to disband as a political party. My question is, how will the U.S. policy, how will US policy adjust to these realities? Are threats of further sanctions and prosecution of the generals in an international court an effective policy and if so, how can it be rationalized with the engagement policy you have pursued for the last year? Thank you, Priscilla. Um, uh, first of all, just a little background by way of first, <coughs> very much appreciate a question on Southeast Asia, where you know, too often when we talk about Asia policy, spend most of our time talking about Northeast Asia. I would say one of the most, uh, I think, innovative uh, uh, directions of uh, foreign policy and national security of the Obama administration has been in Southeast Asia, both the uh, uh, commitment to the U.S. ASEAN uh, process, uh, appointment of an ambassador uh, to ASEAN, signing, signing a treaty of amity and cooperation, and a variety of bilateral steps to build uh, uh, stronger relationships. When the Obama administration came to power, uh, I think there was a desire to look closely at what our uh, approach has been uh, to Burma. After a, an extensive review in which we consulted stakeholders and nonprofits inside governments in the region as a whole, I think we came to the conclusion that both the kind of open engagement strategy uh, of uh, ASEAN without any particular uh, downsides for failure to make uh, uh, adjustments uh, and the sanctions only policy of the United States had uh, failed uh, to accomplish. Uh, its goal of uh, uh, change inside the country. So uh, with the full support of the administration, we have embarked upon uh, a dialogue uh, with uh, North Korea, excuse me, with Burma on a range of issues. Uh, I think it would be fair to say uh, to date uh, that dialogue has been disappointing and it's been very challenging. Priscilla, you know much better uh, 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 than I do. Um, uh, we have sought some specific steps in terms of political prisoners. Aung San Suu Kyi uh, tried to convene or support a domestic dialogue in advance of uh, uh, the elections uh, scheduled now for uh, November and also tried to receive some uh, assurances from Burma about its uh, surreptitious relationship with North Korea. Now, I think it would be fair to say that in almost every arena, we have been disappointed in what we've seen to date. Um, we did say at the outset that, however, that we did not expect this to be a short-term process. It was going to take a long period of time. And what we've tried to do, Priscilla, is not over-promise and under-deliver. I think at every stage, we've tried to be honest about where we are in the process. Uh, I've been able on my trips to, uh, uh, to uh, Rangoon and Naypada to meet Aung San Suu Kyi. She has supported uh, our overall approach and our engagement, as have many other elements inside the country as a whole. We were faced um, uh, with a predicament. I think everything we've seen to date suggests that the November elections will be without international legitimacy, no observers, uh, none of the uh, internationally acknowledged steps that one would see before an election have taken place. Um, at the same time uh, that we uh, regard uh, this path as, uh, as uh, lacking uh, the necessary <coughs> credibility, it is also the case that the period after the election might create new 
uh, players, uh, new uh, power relationships, uh, new structures inside the country. And so we think we need to stand by and see how that plays out. And so we've been in close consultation with all our friends in the region uh, about our, our intentions, which are to keep the door open, to try to work um, uh, towards a, a comprehensive dialogue uh, with the regime and its follow-on uh, successors with the recognition that that is, among all the difficult options, the best possible way forward. We think that it is going to require a combination of uh, some pressure and also uh, some rewards uh, if uh, uh, progress is made. And we are prepared uh, to act in both cases, uh, given developments on the ground. A quick follow-up. What is it that you think the Burmese leaders want? What, what do they want from the U.S.? Uh, Marvin, it would uh, – I probably have spent as much time thinking about two things. What does the North Korean leadership want? <laughs> what do the Burmese – these are two of the hardest cases mm -hmm. in terms of trying to glean and fundamentally understand the motivations and the objectives. Uh, uh, in my uh, first meeting with Da and Sung Suu Kyi, we spent a better part of 30 minutes discussing why – Initially, uh, the leadership wanted a, relate, wanted a dialogue with the United States, and neither of us were uh, entirely sure, sure, and frankly, we're still discussing it going forward. Mm. Uh, uh, ultimately, um, however, uh, one of the few benefits of this uh, effort has been a, uh, a better dialogue with the rest of Southeast Asia, with the rest of ASEAN about Burma. We are now able to say, look, we're trying. Uh, we need more help from you. Right. And it allows us to have a fuller diplomatic engagement, which I think is in the best strategic interest of the United States and the region as a whole. Our last panelist, uh, John Park, who is the director of the Korea Working Group here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary Campbell. Thank you, John. We've been seeing a lot of movement with the Communist Party of China interacting with the Workers' Party of Korea. And it looks like uh, within this period of the accelerated leadership succession process in North Korea, the Communist Party of China is investing considerable amount of political capital as well as economic uh, development assistance to the rising generation of the Workers' Party of Korea. Now, something that has been reaffirmed by both President Hu Jintao and Kim Jong-il and Chang Chun at the end of August. Uh, yet all of this is happening with no re Chinese references or linkage to denuclearization by the uh, North Koreans. So my question is, what are the implications for the U.S.'s denuclearization-centered North Korea policy uh, when we see China going further down this path, this two-party path? Mm. Um, uh, first of all, I, I think that uh, China is attempting to do several things currently on uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the first is to deepen its dialogue with the United States and to share perspectives on the way forward. Uh, the second is I think they have decided to try to build deeper uh, 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 personal connections and institutional affiliations within North Korea, uh, given um, the changes that are currently underway or potentially underway, as you described. Uh, I think uh, third, uh, they are uh, seeking uh, quietly to reassure South Korea that they still want a strong relationship with South Korea. Uh, 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 and uh, that is an important foreign policy, political, and economic goal. And then lastly, I would differ slightly with your assessment. I do uh, hear in all our discussions uh, with uh, Chinese interlocutors, including uh, Ambassador Wu Dawei, who was in Washington two weeks ago, a strong and steady commitment to the return of, to six-party talks and a reaffirmation of the key principles associated with denuclearization. So I think what you're seeing uh, generally is a multifaceted strategy uh, on the part of China that reflects their very deep national uh, interests in uh, uh, developments on the peninsula as a whole. Well, you know, our time is up, I'm sorry to say, and I want to thank you very much, Secretary Campbell, for taking the time and visiting us here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And I think all of us in the audience can show our respect. <laughs> Thank you very much to our panel as well. Ambassador Solomon, to my terrific.